Hi right, everybody, welcome back. If you didn't see the first episode in this series, uh, feel free to check that out. Uh, for those of you who watched that one, we don't need a long introduction. Let's dive right into these bad boys and keep going with the Flaviar Advent Calendar of Whiskey for 2022. We did through number five in the first episode. My goal is to hit another four tonight. Let's get cranking. We'll get all these poured so they can uh, open up a little bit. Again, these are 50 milliliter samples, which are about perfect for a Glen Cairn because you're supposed to pour to the widest part of the bulb of the base of the, of the cup, glass. The good ones of these, anything that's left in the bottom of the vial, I'm adding to my uh, infinity bottle, which I have down here, tucked away. So the way this works is I'm going to try each and every one of them blind first, and then uh, you know make some observations, make some guesses even, talk about how much I like them. And then we'll look up what they actually are, who made it, what their story is. And uh, it's just a great way to sort of get introduced to a wider variety of whiskeys that are out there right now, instead of just the normal stuff that's just always on the shelf in your liquor store. So I'll also rate them one to five. One is I'm never spending money on this at all. And we did have one of those already. Um, three is straight down the middle average, like, hey, I'd drink this if someone put this in front of me. Uh, four would be like, hey, I... I really like this. This is kind of surprising to me. I, I, I'd probably put a bottle of that on my shelf. Five would be like, holy cow, uh, I'm so glad I got introduced to this. I've got to get a bottle. So that's kind of how that system works. All right, let's dive in with uh, number six here. I did have some people in the Patreon group and in the uh, comments section of the last uh, video validate some of the opinions I had on some of these on the first ones where we were all thinking the same thing, especially with number four. Number four was... It was not good. All right, here we go. This is vial number six. Ooh. On the nose, I get like a like a light green apple and a little bit of even like a vinegary sort of a note too, which you can sometimes get with something that's like finished in a wine barrel or something. I, I, I often get like that vinegar note, but it's not heavy on the nose at all. Like I've kind of got to get, I got to get down in there, you know? Well, it's definitely barley. It has a surprising, like, not harsh, but but the, a, a surprising amount of burn on the finish. Because it doesn't come on hot, but it finishes a little hot. Not like real hot, though, just a subtle hotness. It actually reminds me a little bit of, like, just the standard red breast. Not the 12. I've got a, the 12 up here. It's delightful. But just their, their standard stuff. Kind of reminds me of that, but it doesn't finish as as sweet like red breast finishes with that like shortbread that sweet shortbread finish that just drags and it's it's much more viscous too it kind of hangs there this does not hang there it finishes with a subtle burn but it's got that sweetness up front i get a little of honey light fruits like your pears your green apples not a lot of oak not like no tannin whatsoever that's a very chill whiskey like there's not a lot about that, that that even has a chance to offend your palate. A lot of times you taste a whiskey and you're like, oh man, there's this, there's this, there's this. And you're kind of bombarded with these different flavor combinations and uh, different tasting notes. This one's just like pretty low key. It's like, you're gonna get a little bit of this and a little bit of this and that's about it. And then it's gonna wave bye-bye and be on its merry way. Let's see what this one is. This is a Japanese whiskey, EY45. 45% ABV, AKA 90 proof. It says sweet, pear, yeah, I got that as well. Stewed fruits, milk, butterscotch. Yeah, kind of like some similar notes that you would get to an Irish, actually. As close to a fruit forward cocktail bourbon as you can find in Japan. <laughs> the Hambo family has been creating wines and spirits in Japan for more than 100 years. Hey, kudos to them. They added whiskey to their products in 1949, and in 1984, they wanted to move the distilling operation to a cooler climate. So they closed their distillery and built a new one high in the mountains of Nagano at an altitude of more than 2,600 feet, the Mars Shinshu Distillery. That's kind of cool. I love kind of reading up on these places and what their story is, what their vibe is, what their goals are. Mars of Y45, the one that we're drinking today, is a higher proof, 90 proof, version of the same spirit designed for making cocktails. Okay, that's why it's not overly uh, complex in the flavors because most mixing whiskeys are pretty one note. But this is interesting to me. It's only 25% malted barley and 75% corn, but that's why it's all sweet. 
Like it's just complete sweet. But to me, the 25% the barley overrides the corn in the palate and the corn overrides the barley in the finish. That's why we were getting that subtle burn on the end, but the sweet up front. But 25% malted barley is, is ab absurdly high for a bourbon. It is aged in X bourbon casks. So that's another factor too. So an actual bourbon, this is their take on a bourbon in Japan. An actual bourbon for, per American standards has to be aged in virgin oak casks that are charred. So you're gonna pull a lot of, I mean, this one right next to it is a lot darker. You're gonna pull a lot more color out of the barrel if it's a virgin barrel. You're also gonna pull out a lot more of those caramelized roasted flavors out of the wood too with that char and then the red layer underneath it. But uh, this is aged in an X bourbon cask. They're gonna call it a cask, it's a barrel. <clears throat> but it's already been used to make bourbon. So an American bourbon has already stripped a lot of the color and a lot of the flavor out of that wood. That's why this one tastes so much more like an Irish or a Scotch because it's not in that fresh cooperage. It's in used cooperage. So you don't get a lot of that oak. Like I said, while tasting it, don't get a lot of oak, don't get a lot of tannins. That's why. I don't dislike it. I drink it if somebody gave it to me, but again, I don't see myself going out and buying a bottle of it. So probably like a three, two or a three. I don't think it's, nah, maybe not a two. I think two's a little too harsh. Three. If somebody set it down in front of me, yeah, I'm gonna drink it. And I'll, and I'll enjoy it for what it is. Let's move on to number seven. Number seven, compare like color wise, it's already much different. This is much darker in the color. What do we get on the nose here? Not a lot of burn. What's the ABV on this? Let me look. It's about the same. It's 92% ABV. This one was 90. Not a ABV, proof. <laughs> Jeez. If it, it was 92 ABV, I'd be on the I'd be on the floor. It was 92 proof. This one was 90 proof. So yeah, not a lot of burn on the nose, but I get like a sweet caramel. Or maybe more like a honeycomb, like a sweet honeycomb. It's not quite as roasty as caramel on the nose. More like a subtle sweetness, like a honeycomb. I don't get a lot of like wood notes, oak notes on the nose though. Maybe like a white grape too. What do we get on the palate, huh? I almost get like a, on the finish. I know I'm supposed to talk about the palate first, but I let that sit for a second. On the finish, I get Raisin Bran. Like that bran cereal with that light, that light uh, sugary glaze on it in Raisin Bran. That finish is like, like literally just like Raisin Bran. I love that. Not a lot of heat to that at all. It's a caramely sweetness up front and it finishes like a cereal, like a sweet cereal, a grain cereal. It's so interesting. There's like a an exact moment where the flavor just straight up changes from the palate to the finish. And they're so they're so uh, different from one another. Normally it just kind of like molds into the finish. But the two parts of that are just so distinct from one another. That's peculiar. Not a lot of bite to it. It's very crushable, butter, like sweet butterscotch on the palate and that brand cereal finish. I'm gonna be honest, I quite like that. I think that's really good. Maybe like a blend of bourbons where they're kind of creating a more um, diverse flavor profile, dis uh, distinguishing between the two, you know, the palate and the finish. Let's see what that is. Number seven, it is Kansas City Whiskey from Jay Rieger and Company. I said butterscotch. They say butterscotch. Tasting notes, uh, sherry. Caramel, butterscotch, corn, fruit, almond, allspice. The allspice and almond I could see on the finish there for sure. It says a beautiful whiskey blend with a drop of fine sherry. Founded by an, Aust an Austrian immigrant, Jacob Rieger, and later taken over by his family. It used to be the largest mail order whiskey in the world until the good old prohibition came up. That's interesting. Neat little out, uh, Neat little accolade. A blend of straight bourbon whiskey, like I said, a blend of uh, maybe bourbons, light corn whiskey and straight rye whiskey. Kansas City whiskey brings together different whiskeys that were all aged for at least four years, hence the straight name. Plus a nice little drop of 15 year old Oloroso Sherry from the Williams. Oh, that's interesting. So it's not actually finished in like an Oloroso Sherry cask. It literally just has sherry in it. They put a drop of sherry, 15 year old Oloroso sherry. That's cool. 
Hence why it can't be called a bourbon. It can't be called, you know, because it ha per the uh, the standards of identity, you can't call it that if you have an additive of any kind in it. So it's technically breaking some of those rules for rye whiskey or bourbon whiskey. Hence why it's just called Kansas City whiskey. You know, I like that. I'm gonna give that a four. I'd buy a bottle of that if I saw it for a reasonable price on a shelf somewhere. I'd pick up a bottle of Rieger's Kansas City Whiskey. That's pretty good. Shall we move on to number eight? What do we got here? Oh, that nose is so different. I can't get down in there too far because it actually burns the nose a little bit. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's 65% ABV. Really? A 65% ABV. 130 proof, are you kidding me? That's why I couldn't get my nose deep down in there. But it doesn't have like a deep, like a rich um, dark caramely note to it at all, despite being a high ABV. It smells much lighter than that, a little bit fruitier, a little bit sweeter. I get light fruits like your pears, or maybe even like a, a dried apricot, or like a dessert pastry, you know, like a dessert, like an apple dessert pastry. That's what I get on the nose. But there's definitely that burn there, which is reflected in the ABV. Let's go in on it. Yo. It's not like a harsh burn, but it, it tastes, like it feels light, but tastes heavy, if that makes any sense at all. Like it's got some girth to it in terms of ABV, or, or maybe like a potency is a, bit, a better word for it. It feels, it tastes very potent, but not heavy, you know what I mean? I almost get, um, remember Necco wafers? Remember Necco wafers? I never liked them too much, but my brother loved them, so we always had them in the house growing up, because he would always have rolls of Necco wafers laying around. And I wasn't crazy about them, but I'd, I'd eat them if they were around. That's what I get off of this. And I also get that same vibe. It's like, I don't know that I'd go out of my way for this, but if it's there, I'll drink it. It tastes almost like it's half and half, like 50%, I know this is gonna sound weird. This tastes like it's half an Irish whiskey, and half vodka. Let's see what it is. It is two stacks Irish whiskey, the blender's cut, cask strength. Well, that explains the ABV for sure. Tasting notes, caramel, honey, pineapple. Oh, I can see the pineapple. Tobacco, peaty. I don't know that I got peaty off that person. I don't think I got any peat off of that. Fruit, cake, I said pastry, sweet. This beast of a dram is the highest proof Irish whiskey on the market at the time of its release. That doesn't surprise me, honestly. <laughs> Two Stacks was launched in 2020 by a group of three friends, Shane McCarthy, Donald McLean, <laughs> and Liam Brogan. <laughs> Definitely Irishmen, who had spent six years working together in the craft beverage importing and distribution business. With the Irish whiskey renaissance well underway, they deemed the time was ripe for a proper whiskey brand, a contemporary brand built upon Irish whiskey's rich heritage. They borrowed the name from the two chimney stacks of the Dundalk distillery that were so tall that seamen <laughs> used them as navigation point. Sorry, I'm three whiskeys deep now. I can make lewd jokes. <laughs> Their Killowin distillery might be the smallest in Ireland, but size only matters to a point. Blender's Cut is a cask strength version of their two stacks whiskey that comes from Dundalk's Great Northern Distillery. It's a blend of malt, grain, and pot still whiskey. Five juices in total, aged in virgin oak X bourbon, as well as sherry casks. Oh, so I was confused. Okay, so, so it's five different juices, right? And those are aged in some virgin oak, some X bourbon, and some sherry casks. X sherry. Bottled at 130 proof, it's one beastly and rich blend with a complex balance of spice, fruit, and a touch of peat. If there's any peat in there, it is definitely just a touch, I'll tell you that much. I don't dislike it, but it almost feels like it's just a high proof point just for the sake of being a high proof point. But five, a blend of five different whiskeys in here, aged in different methods. You've got X sherry X bourbon and virgin oak. I want, I want to know about that virgin oak though, was it... Like what level of char was it on the barrel? Going in again, I almost want to retract what I said about the vodka and replace it with gin. I almost get that juniper medicinal sort of quality out of it. Starts like an Irish, ends like a gin. 
That's number eight. Whoo, that's got some. <laughs> His potent, potent was the word I used. What's this one? Oh, we're going way down. We're going way down on this one. This one is 80 proof. 130 proof down to 80 proof. This is gonna, I hope this one didn't blow out my palate. Ooh, nose is way different. I almost expected it to be hard to get much of a nose out of this one with it only being 80. But again, I get like a light fruit note. Not like not your dark, rich, you know, like wines and, and dates and raisins. No, this is more like your pears, star fruit. Actually, have you ever had star fruit? Star fruit tastes like a, a timid apple without like the crunch. I used uh, star fruit uh, for a couple of different cocktail recipes that I did maybe about a year, year and a half ago now. And so I kind of got used to the flavor of star fruit because I was, I was uh, peeling and cutting them myself. And of course you're munching as you're doing it. This gives me star fruit vibes, but also like a, like a gentle peat. Not like a, not an eyelid peat, you know, like real smoky, but it's just sort of, sort of an underlying note there. Smells less like an Irish, more like a Scotch or Japanese whiskey on this one. Let's go in on it. That is so light. That is so light in comparison to the last one, the freaking 130 proof, are you kidding me? Starts very sweet, very barley forward. And uh, sweet grain is really sort of the, the name of the game on this one. There's no like dark, rich notes. It's more fruity and light. And, um, and, and you get that light grain throughout all of it. You know, start, middle, and finish. Palette and finish on that, that light grain. I kind of wish they didn't dilute it so much. I feel like there's more in there to pull out of it, but it's hard because it feels almost too watered down. That's a little bit disappointing. Yeah, it tastes like there's more in there to detect if they didn't dilute it so much. Like even color-wise, you compare it to these, oof. Like you compare it to this one, you probably can't see from that far away, but this one looks like apple juice, you know, or like a, um, like a Miller Lite in color. Very delicate. Not a single bit of burn on that. You could drink that like apple juice. Yeah, I wish they wouldn't have diluted it so much. I feel like there's more in there that I'd like to pull out of that whiskey. Which, anytime they dilute it down so much, I find that a little bit disappointing. You know, two things could be the case when they dilute it down that much. One, if you're being generous, is that there's some good flavors in there, but I can't quite pull them out because you watered it down too much. And uh, I, I wish you would revert that, not water it down quite as much. Instead of 40%, go 45, 46. Um, give me a good solid 90 proof out of that. And maybe I can pull more out of it. The other alternative, which is the pessimistic view, is that their whiskey doesn't taste as good as they wanted it to. So they water it down so you can't detect the... Um, like the, the, the not so great congeners that may have come through in the distillation process, because a lot of flavor is created in the distillation process. You know, a lot of people, they spend a, a lot of time thinking about the mash bill and they think about the barrel. Like what was the, was it X sherry or was it a bourbon? Was it X bourbon? Was it X rock? You know, and they look at those two parts of the, of the, uh, the process of making whiskey, but right there in the middle is this very crucial part of making whiskey. And that is the distillation process. And so if this tastes obviously, like I said, more like a scotch or a Japanese, which means they're probably uh, pot stilling it. And a pot still, you have so much control, you know, with the shape of the still, with what kinds of congeners you're allowing to get through that process. So if you water it down so much, it almost feels, if you're a pessimist, like you're trying to hide the fact that your still is letting through some stuff that you didn't want it to let through. You know what I mean? So a lot of times, if you look at these pot stills, the shape of the still kind of lets you know what the distiller is going for. Because the more contact that the distillate has with the copper lining, the more filtration basically happens along the way. Uh, and there's this thing called reflux where, you know, um, your whiskey, it, well, before it's whiskey, your distillate is evaporating, coming in contact with copper 
and then condensing again, falling back down. And it goes through that process a lot. And that's called reflux, that up, down, up, down. And things are going with the whiskey as it goes up and back down, up and back down. And the more times it makes that journey, the fewer congeners make it through the gooseneck and, you know, and into your final product. But some distillers out there will shape it in such a way that um, they can control what, what congeners get to go through. Um, and sometimes that can create some really interesting flavor profiles. But this to me, I, the pessimist in me says some congeners got through that they weren't happy with. They watered it down too much. The uh, optimist in me says, hey, show off your product a little more. Don't, don't dilute it so much. I want to taste what all there is to pull out of this. And right now it's so hard to do that because it's, it's 80 proof. You know what I mean? That is literally 60% water. That's more water than whiskey in there by, by too much. So I'm a little bit disappointed in that one. <clears throat> I'd give that one a two. Let's see what number nine is. This is the San In Blended Japanese Whiskey. Uh, I said light fruits. It says a pear, apricot. Yep, just like I said on those. It even says lime. That's an interesting tasting note that I don't think I pulled out of there. A refreshing masterpiece from the land of the rising sun. I would not call that a masterpiece. I think that's being a little too generous there. The distillery is within sight of Mount Desenf. Desenf? I don't want to mess it up. A volcanic peak rising more than a mile above the surrounding fertile plains. This is significant because the spring water used to distill their sake and whiskey and bring it to proof has filtered through volcanic stone for eons, resulting in significant purity and unique soft mineral composition. I would say soft mineral composition is, is a fair way to describe what's going on in there. The distillery keeps a low profile, unfortunately just like their whiskey. It's almost enigmatic with no visitor sensor or direct sales. It's a blend of their own malt and carefully sourced grain whiskeys. Aged in white oak barrels, okay. It's almost like they really wanted that spring water that volcanic mineral spring water to be the star of this and not their distillate. And that to me is um, personally not what I'm looking for in a whiskey. You know, um, those, you know, that's an interesting thing for sure. I mean, there's other uh, distillers out there that pride themselves on the kind of water they use. You've got, for example, Eastern Kill here, pride themselves on using uh, fresh lake water that is uh, obviously purified, uh, but lake water from the Great Lakes. And that's kind of a cool feature. You've got um, Brackenridge Distillery, which prides themselves on using snow melt up there in the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. So there's definitely other distilleries out there that, that use, that it's a big pride point for them, the kind of water that they use in you know their whole process, their mash, um, in their distillation and in their and they're proofing, because obviously you gotta you gotta water down your your distillate uh, when it comes off the still and before it goes in the barrel and when it comes out of the barrel. Most unless it is specifically barrel proof. Uh, so, anyways, that's not unusual for somebody to take a lot of pride in that, but it is unusual for them to make it the star. And I feel like this is <laughs> they're trying to show off their water more than their whiskey here, and I'm not I'm not really digging that. There you have it, six, seven, eight, and nine. What do you guys think? So we've got the two Japanese whiskeys, the Kansas City whiskey, and the Irish knock your face off 130 proof whiskey in this particular lineup. If I was to rank these four alone, Kansas City whiskey is in number one and um, by, a, by a landslide, I would say. Number one by a landslide. Number two, I think I would say the EY Japanese for sure. And number three, the Irish that's just looking to blow your face off. And then in number four, the last place one would definitely be this um, this last Japanese whiskey that's more water than, than whiskey. But I do like that so far with the Flaviar Advent Collection, we've seen rye, bourbons, Irish, Japanese, Indian, Scotch. We've seen a wide variety of whiskeys. Now I will tell you that I have, I will tell you up front, I should be upfront about this. I do have a bit of a bias because I started on scotch. My very first whiskeys were scotch whiskeys. And I very much for a while had this, um, this sort of idea that was 
sort of driven into my head that scotch whiskey was the pinnacle of whiskeys, right? And that everything else out there was competing to try and be either a better scotch than scotch could be or just something so off the wall and different that it didn't have to compete. And that's sort of uh, what I was taught uh, with my early whiskey days. And then I came full circle and I did a bunch of reading on whiskey history, different whiskey uh, distillation methods and all that stuff. And, the, and, and even the chemistry behind distillation and whiskey flavor creation that happens from the grain to the barrel and everything in between. And ultimately, I actually ended up kind of landing in the, uh, the bourbon genre. I'm a big bourbon lover, and I, I love bourbons, and I love American whiskeys, and rye whiskey too, but, but bourbon is sort of my, my go-to, it's my staple now, and my, my shelf here has a, I mean, it's, I'm talking like 30 bourbon bottles. I've got two Irish and three scotches up there, and four rye whiskeys, but it's, it's a, a lot of bourbon. So, I do kind of... You know, I said that the Kansas City was my favorite on the table here today. And that's the one that's cl most closely like a bourbon. There is literally bourbon in there. Um, and so that's no surprise. But with the first five, my number one actually was the blended scotch. And I knew it was a scotch. You can taste the difference. But um, but I was a fan of that particular blended scotch. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but I liked that one quite a bit. So anyways, that's where I'm at. Thanks for watching the video. Let me know what you guys thought of these four. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Love you guys so much. Um, excited to do, I've got a couple of different videos um, kind of on the table right now that I'm gonna be working on. As we're, I, I will obviously continue with the Flaviar stuff. Um, I even wanna do one of these episodes when, once I get caught up, because now I'm up to number nine and obviously it's what the 14th today, at least the time we're recording this. So I've got some more catching up to do. Once I get caught up with you guys, I would love to do a live Discord call with my Patreon supporters to you know, do a few of these together. Would be kind of fun, I think, um, once I get caught up, because I know that some of you guys are already ahead of me. I know uh, at least two of you, I know that Brian and Scott are both ahead of me. So I gotta get caught up to you guys. Do that live, be a fun thing to do together, I think. Um, but beyond that, I've got a couple of whiskey cocktails that I'd like to show you guys, some of my favorite whiskey cocktails. And I also am doing my very first ever Patreon paycheck purchase. So that's what I'm going to call it. But I'm going to do a bottle review where I'm going to, as the Patreon continues to grow, obviously the things I can purchase are going to be a little bit different. But for the first month, you know, with the uh, number of patrons that we have right now, I decided to take the Patreon money and make a purchase for a bottle that I could review on the channel. So it's going to be uh, the Weller 107. I already ordered it. And uh, so we'll review that one uh, here on the channel too. And that'll be my first Patreon paycheck purchase bottle that we'll cover. Excited about that one. I've had it before. I've not had a full bottle before. I've had um, a couple of pours of it before a couple of different times and loved it. Um, one of the best of the Weller lineup in my opinion. So that'll be fun. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys so much. Be warm and well fed. Um, let's get the Kansas City one. Cheers. May you get better with age and may you enrich the lives of the people around you just like this whiskey enriches our lives together as a community. See you in the next one.